Uh, my name is Toph Marshall. I'm a professor of Greek at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. And this year, I'm spending time at the American School for Classical Studies in Athens, where I'm supposed to be writing a book on Aristophanes. I'm supposed to be writing a book on the frogs. And so uh, I thought I would use this opportunity. I'm very grateful to Dr. Bacala and to the department at the University of Warwick for inviting me to come speak with you today. Um, I'm thrilled at the size of this audience. But I wanted to uh, deal with what I think are some of the more challenging passages of the play. Um, in many ways, if you heard uh, Dr. Scott's lecture this morning, I'm going to be building on some of the observations that he made and uh, hopefully filling them out and, and going a little more in depth into the way that Aristophanes chose to engage with his fellow citizens. It's uh, not the way that, polit uh, that comedians often engage with things today. And I think it's worth looking at the way that he thought he might be able to influence the city. One of the terms that Dr. Scott used this morning was comedumenos, the uh, people that get singled out in the audience and picked on during the course of a play. And I wanted to start by thinking about the very first name that we get in the play. It's not Dionysus, it's not Xanthius. In our scripts we see that, but they're not called that right away. The first name we get in line 13 is Phrynichus. Who is Phrynichus? Now the thing is, when someone mentions Phrynichus on a comic stage in a play that's a comedy about uh, baggage jokes, everyone is going to know they're referring to comic, the comic poet Phrynichus. Uh, whose career almost exactly matched that of Aristophanes. He started a few years earlier um, and at least uh, was still competing against uh, the frogs at the Lanaia in 405. But the thing is, that's not the only Phrynichus that there was about. Um, a number of years earlier, there had been a tragedian called Phrynichus. And this seems to have been a common name. There's no sense that they were necessarily related though there are theatrical families in Athens. But twice reference is made to the tragic Phrynichus too. And you and I can't be expected to disentangle those references when they're made on stage in a comedy that we're watching 2,400 years later. But uh, the tragic Phrynichus was infamous. In the year 476, he had written a play called The Phoenician Women, which sounds really good and safe and mythical. But in fact, he was talking about the Battle of Salamis. And the Battle of Salamis had happened only a couple of years before. And his play so upset the Athenians that they passed a resolution to fine him. His play angered them so much that they wanted money out of this guy, which is an unusual response to art and to theater. But it shows that this contemporary of Aeschylus could provoke with tragedy, and it's a provocation that Aeschylus himself rose to. The earliest play that we have by Aeschylus is The Persians, which is also referring to a historical event. To our knowledge, Aeschylus was not fined. But it's not just Phrynichus the comedian and Phrynichus the tragedian that we're expected to know in this play. There are other Phrynichoi as well. There's a comic actor who fortunately isn't mentioned in this play. But there is a third one that is mentioned in the play at line 689, and that's Phrynichus the oligarch, a politician. He had been a general. He had established the oligarchic coup that had overturned the democracy in 411, and he was assassinated a few years later as part of the uh, restoration of democracy immediately afterwards. There hadn't been many political assassinations in Athens, but this wasn't the first one. And I think thinking about who Phrynichus is is a good way to start thinking about the frogs because here we have a comic poet, here we have a tragic poet, and here we have a politician turning over the democracy. And those three things all sort of come together. It's also striking to me that the word frune, phryne, means frog or toad. And when we have a play called The Frogs, and the first name that we hear is Mr. Toad, I think we should be alert to look deeper into some of the things that we're going to be hearing. So with that as sort of my preamble, I want to now 
pick up on some of the themes that Dr. Scott talked about with the Battle of Arganusi, because the Battle of Arganusi in 406 had happened immediately before this play would have been proposed and was put on. The Battle of Arganusi in 406 had been a victory for the Athenians. We know that slaves did row at the battle. The historian Xenophon tells us this. And the play is referred to at least three times directly and a number of times indirectly over the course of the, of the play. I've put the line numbers here so that you can check later with the translation that you're reading for your classes. But it's mentioned at the very beginning. It's mentioned just before they launch on their voyage to the underworld. And it's mentioned when the audience is addressed directly by the chorus. Now, the slaves that rode at this battle, in particular, were granted citizenship. And the scholar, Philip Hunt, tells us that in, uh, in his article in 2001 that the number must have been in the thousands. So all of a sudden, there are thousands of new citizens in the city of Athens. Now, some of these were slaves who had come from the silver mines in Lorien. And so now all of a sudden there are thousands of slaves not digging silver, which has helped keep Athens rich. Some of them will have come from private houses. And perhaps you can put yourself into the mind of a slave owner for a minute or two and think about what you might feel if all of a sudden your property was said to be free because of something that they were enjoined to do when you had no part in that. This act to enfranchise the slaves will have angered many of the elites in Athens. Now we're told the slave that we meet early in the play, Xanthius, didn't serve. He had an eye infection. But we are also told that because of the plays of Euripides, no one wants to volunteer to pay taxes anymore. They don't want to, the rich don't want to pay for choruses and for triremes which was the cornerstone of the Athenian taxation system. Now, the play also makes reference to the flagship of the Athenian fleet, the Paralus. Now, this was a ship, I, I think it's the one that's uh, presented here on the marble inscription. We don't know for sure, but uh, that's what scholars say. Uh, this marble inscription was found on the Acropolis, and it dates from within five years of our play. The crew of the Paralus was all citizens, unlike the other ships. So that's how we know that slaves did normally row. But what happened at this battle was that the slaves that were rowing, the slaves that were recruited to serve in this particular battle, were going to be freed. And there was going to be a lot of uh, civic uprest as a result of that. Now, as you heard this morning, the follow-up to this victory wasn't celebration, but was condemnation of the generals. The generals were tried, and those that stayed in Athens were executed. And two of the figures involved in these trials are mentioned by name over the course of the play. So you're going to hear these names, but these names are immediate politicians who have helped the democracy turn on its leaders. One of them is Theramenes, who's called the boot. The word is Cathornus. It's the word we often associate with the tragic boot. But he got this nickname because apparently Cathorna could be worn equally well on either foot. And as the winds of politics changed, so did Theramenes' political allegiances. He had been one of the oligarchs, but he also turned against the oligarchy when the democracy looked like it might be reinstated. And he was also involved in the Arganusi affair. We're told he was a follower of Euripides, if that matters. The other is Archidemus, who is called the bleary-eyed. Now, I'm going to say I, like many of you, might have earned that nickname in antiquity. We don't know quite why he got the name. But nevertheless, having bad vision seems to have been Archidemus's fault. Not just physical vision, but also perhaps his political foresight. He helped prosecute the generals at Arganusi, and he is mentioned twice. And then there's a weird line towards the end of the play where we're, again, mention of a sea battle happens, and we're talking about vinegar throwing in, our, in, in people's eyes. To my knowledge, no one really knows what that joke means. But if we look, we can see that problems with foresight 
problems with vision are a recurring theme from early on in the play. And the corrupting influence of Euripides is perhaps also felt in and around the events of Argonusi, which would have been right around the time the playwright had died. So I say that to get us into the mindset of someone who only a few months later is watching this comedy. This comedy on a cold winter's day, perhaps. This is fresh. And one of the things that we find in almost all of Aristophanes' comedies that seems to have been regular, though not always in the middle of all the comedies of this period, is what we call the parabasis. Now, you'll have read about the parabasis as you're studying the play, but I'm going to spend some time thinking about the parabasis of the frogs because I think it's particularly challenging for us, and it's one of the most difficult bits to get our head around. The play stops. We're no longer in the underworld. Everyone breaks character, and the chorus speaks to the audience. Now, the structure of the parabasis of frogs is very straightforward. There's two songs sung by the chorus. It's the same melody repeated, just with different words, and each time it's followed by 20 lines exactly by the chorus leader that are chanted. Now, I'm going to go through this in a bit of detail because I think it picks out some of the themes that we've already touched on. The initial choral song focuses on an individual called Cleophon. Now, again, Cleophon isn't a name that means a lot to us, but he was the most influential democratic politician after the restoration of the democracy, after the oligarchic coup of 411. And in 404, within a year of this play, he was going to be executed when the 30 tyrants staged their second coup. It was easy to make jokes about him. Maybe he had reddish hair, but they, uh, it was said that his father was a Thracian. Perhaps he just served in Thrace as a soldier. But this person was important enough that in the same festival where Frogs was being performed, a comic poet called Plato, this isn't Plato the philosopher, but Plato comicus, Plato the funny one, put on a play that was called Cleophon. So Cleophon was a central figure in another play that year, that same festival, and he's the first person named in the parabasis, the stepping aside of Aristophanes' frogs. And in the next choral song, we don't know who Cleogenes is to the same extent, but the text focuses on him. What we do know is that he was elected the council secretary, the secretary to the boule, the year after the democracy was restored. He was important for maintaining that democracy after that first oligarchic coup. The jokes about him call him a monkey, and I don't think we really know what that's referring to. So Cleophon and Cleogenes are what the chorus are singing about, these democratic figures. And against them, we have the chorus leader who just says, listen. The citizenship of slaves is important. This is the passage that mentioned Phrynichus earlier on. Phrynichus the oligarch. And it's also the passage that dealt with Argonusi explicitly. And in this passage, we're told that the sacred chorus should give advice and instruction to the city, and that instruction is relax your anger, because the Athenians were very, very angry right now. They were angry at the Spartans, who had been beating them down for decades. They were angry at the generals whom they had executed. They were angry at those that had voted. Some of them were angry at those who had voted to use their slaves. But Aristophanes says, relax your anger. And the counterpoint to that, when the, following the second song, focuses on the financial situation. But it ties that financial situation also to citizenship. As Dr. Scott mentioned this morning, 
they had had to melt down gold that was stored in the Acropolis at the Temple of Athena Nike in order to pay their overseas debts. And they no longer had the same number of slaves working in the mines, so they were using a debased coinage for their interior financial dealings. And everyone just had to accept that the money wasn't worth as much as it used to be. We don't respect good citizens, Aristophanes tells us. Like the coins, we should change our ways and choose good people and not accept debased people that are being foisted upon us. So I'm giving you that detailed examination of a passage that you're going to see in the performance this afternoon. It's actually done brilliantly. Back in the, uh, in my opinion, um, the, uh, the lawgiver in Athens was Solon, and he gave us the metaphor of the ship of state, where the polis is like a, steer, uh, like a ship that needs steering, and a good uh, uh, tillerman, who is uh, the, the, the governor of the tiller, um, is, is what a good city needs. Um, it's the passage where they're all taking turns steering the ship that you'll see later on, so uh, be aware of that. We're told in a later summary that the play was reperformed because of its parabasis. It's because of this advice about the value of democracy and the value of citizenship and the value of letting go of anger that this play was being reperformed. Now, I'm going to say very good scholars have disagreed with this ancient summary and even thought that it must have been corrupted over the Middle Ages. That can't possibly be what it means. They must mean it's because of the catabasis, because of the descent to the underworld, and they amend the text. But the text is clear that it's because of the parabasis, and I think we need to be honest and at least wrestle with the possibility that that's so. So if we understand the parabasis a little bit better now, we can go back to our ships. This is only a few months after the Battle of Argonusi, and it's fresh. And early on in the play, a corpse is brought on stage. Now, we don't know if the corpse is being carried or if it's rolled as it would have been rolled in an Athenian funeral procession. I apologize. Uh, this picture comes from around 750 BC, so it's uh, more than 350 years out of date, but it's what I could find. Um, but you can see the corpse there and the mourners and the ch wheels of the chariot. But whether it's being carried in a funeral procession on a chariot or whether it's people carrying a stretcher, a choice is being made by the director. A choice is being made how to represent the necros, the corpse that's on his way to the underworld. Is this an old man who has died natural causes, given the gray beard? Or is it a drowned sailor? And the thing is, we don't know. But I'm going to say the director has a choice here in how he chooses to present that corpse. Who has died most recently in the Athenian imagination? Whose funeral processions have been filling up our public spaces with their laments? And I'm going to say part of it is the dead of Argonusi. So while it's a very funny, very short scene, where he's not willing to take a part-time job. Nevertheless, there can be a darkness in the choices that are made in staging this particular scene. And then another boat appears, or another chariot appears of some kind. Charon appears in his boat to take Dionysus across the, uh, across the pond. Now, a number of years ago, I wrote an article in which I suggested that the boat was an itty-bitty little boat, that it was the echoclema that would roll out during tragic plays in order to reveal murders that had happened inside, and that this was part of the established theater apparatus already being redeployed for comic purposes. So it's like a giant skateboard that Charon comes on, and I thought I was really clever with that idea. That would have been a paratragic 
use a staging decision, a paratragic staging decision. And it's still possible that that's what happened. But since then, I've been thinking more and more about the ritual context and thinking about processions in Athens. And associated with the worship of Dionysus was a big ship cart in which someone as Dionysus would be processed around the city in a wagon that was done up to look like a trireme. And this too would evoke the Battle of Argonusi, this para-ritual decision. Now I'm not going to tell you, no one will be able to tell you which one it certainly was. I'm no longer convinced, however, that the paratragic one is the one that creates the most meaning for this play. And a Dionysus-like ship cart that looked like a trireme and that we would have seen in the processions at the Dionysia and at the rural Dionysia might very well have been the staging decision that was made. Now in the play, Dionysus is taught how to row. He's taught how to be an oarsman in a trireme. And this is a funny scene, because it's not a trireme in that he's the only person rowing aboard. Here we can see um, an Athenian vase from about 50 years before the play, uh, possibly more, um, which shows us how they imagine Charon to appear, or they might imagine Charon to appear. And I just love the little floating soul that's winging its way into his hand there. But there was another comedy from a few decades beforehand in which Dionysus was taught to row. One of Aristophanes' dramatic rivals, Eupolis, who seems to have died as a war casualty in 411 or 410, Eupolis had written a play called The Generals, The Taxiarchs, in which Dionysus is taught to row. We don't know its date for sure. Most say it's 428, but it might be just before the Sicilian expedition in 415 in which someone says, you at the front, will you, will you not stop splashing us? He can't get the rhythm right as he's pulling the oar. Now, that wasn't the first time that Dionysus had appeared on stage in a comedy. There was another play by Cratinus, another rival of Aristophanes, who was sort of a generation older than Aristophanes, a play called the Dionysus Alexandros, or Dionysus Becomes Paris. In this play, Dionysus hears that there's going to be a contest of the goddesses, and he wants to see the other goddesses naked, or he wants to see his sisters naked, depending on how creepy we want to make him. But he disguises himself as Paris in order to become the judge. He is given Helen... He then gets caught because he hears the whole Greek army is coming after Helen. He turns himself into a ram, and Paris then comes to rescue him. And this was an elaborate parody against Pericles, apparently, that either dates from 437 or the early years of the Peloponnesian War. We've talked about Eupolis's taxi arcs, which might also date from the early years of the Peloponnesian War, and which Dionysus is taught to row. Eupolis also wrote a play called Deans. Dean is one of the words for a neighborhood in Athens, either a small village or a section of the city. I don't know what a chorus of Deans looks like, but it's a good time machine question. If any of you ever invented a time machine, I'd like to know. In which political heroes of the past are brought back because Athens needs help. And it's like a necromancy in which they are brought back up from the underworld in order to give advice to the city. Aristophanes had also written an underworld play before this called the Geritades, in which three slight poets go to the underworld. Slight is my translation of the word leptos. They are apparently both physically scrawny, so they're close to death already because they're starving, but also their poetry is lightweight. And so a bad comedian, a bad tragedian, and a lame dithyrambist all go to the underworld. And that was only two years before the frogs. Another poet, Phrecrates, wrote a play called the Krapatoloi, the, uh, the Little Minnows, 
in which there's a journey to the underworld in which someone meets Aeschylus. We've got a line from Aeschylus from that play, I who constructed and handed on to them a great craft. And the word craft there, if you've got any Greek, is the word techne, which is a word that's associated with Euripides in frogs. That's fragment 100 of Pericrates. The way I've positioned it there it suggests that it's before 405 and uh, after 407. We don't actually know. It could have been any time in the 20 years before that. But Phrynichus was writing a play at the Lanaia of 405 as well, a play called The Muses. And there is a, we've already mentioned Plato's Cleophon. Now, the early mention of Phrynichus that I started with also mentions two other poets, Lycus and Amitsias. And some people think that those are the five poets who are competing at the festival. He gets all the names in early. A play by Phrynichus called Cronus also had Dionysus as a character. And Phrynichus also wrote a play called The Initiates with the same chorus that we see after we see the frogs. And Muses, the play that is being performed either right before or right after Aristophanes' frogs, had a character on trial. And because the chorus are muses and they're being compared to the Furies, some scholars have thought that that character might be Euripides. And there were people who had written comedies based on, with choruses of frogs as well, Callias and Magnes, and we don't have dates for them, but we know that they predated our play. Now I'm giving you this because we think of frogs as a comedy about tragedies, but it's also a comedy about comedies. Aristophanes expects people to know some of these things. You don't need to know them all. You might not have been alive when Dionysus Alexandros was put on stage, but you might have heard stories about the time Dionysus wanted to see the goddesses naked, or the time he learned how to row. You will have seen or heard report, contemporary reports of the underworld plays and plays with Aeschylus, and plays with Euripides. So if we look at the themes that we've got here, Dionysus in disguise, Dionysus as a judge, Dionysus learns to row, going to the underworld in order to help the city, going to the underworld involving bad poets, going to the underworld for Aeschylus, Dionysus combining poetry, politics, and Euripides, and a chorus of frogs, we start to see that what Aristophanes is doing isn't just making something up, but he's engaging with previous comedies seriously. His creativity is bringing all these plays and all the tragedies as well, all these factors into one coherent storyline. So Frogs is a comedy that draws on earlier comedy as much as it draws on tragedy. It's engaged with the literary scene, not just of recent years, but of decades past going to the start of the war. And through all of this, Aristophanes believes that the poet, and particularly the comic poet, has a chance to change things. We are told that the role of a poet, of a playwright, is to advise the city. The chorus in the Parabasis, the sacred chorus, should give advice and instruction to the city. We, poets, make people in the cities better, says Euripides. The teacher teaches children, poets teach grown-ups, say Aeschylus. And whichever of you is prepared to offer the city some good advice, that's the one that I'm taking home with me, says Dionysus. Every character in the play agrees that this is what poetry does. It's not up for debate. And the advice that Aristophanes gives is to relax your anger, change your ways, and choose good people. He uses the imagery of the coinage. He uses the example of the slaves at Argonusi. He valorizes the restoration of the democracy and he condemns those who are adopting politically convenient views and switching their positions based on the way the wind's blowing. Choose good people. He's telling you to vote, to be involved in the city, 
and he thinks this is relevant. And it's out of this that we come to the question that the play ends with, is which of you has an opinion about Alcibiades? What do we do with the turncoat general who defied the gods at a drinking party, maybe was responsible for the loss of our ships at Sicily, somehow managed to defect and avoid the worst consequences of the oligarchy, but comes back to rescue us when it's convenient, but happens not to be around right now unless it's convenient for him. How do we deal with politicians who let down the people they're supposed to be representing? This is the question that Aristophanes is facing. This is the question that he wants everyone in his audience to leave with an opinion on. He tells us what he thinks in the Parabasis. He comes right out and says it. We know that Frogs had another director. Aristophanes himself wrote the play, but he, didn't, he wasn't the didaskalos, the teacher for the play. And some have wanted that to be an indication that he was a character in the play, that he was acting. Maybe that he would play Dionysus himself. But I think it's just as likely that he would play the chorus leader, the one who is heartfelt in this desperate plea. It's certainly Aristophanes' voice that we're hearing. 